Hello, I have announcements this morning, but before I do announcements, we have somebody that would like to greet you guys. Good morning, Hannah Chapel. Good morning. I thought she would be the best person, because if you know me, you know that she's my best friend, so we are tag teaming it this morning. Thank you so much, Rai. Appreciate that. Um, so... Uh, we are so glad that you are with us this morning, and like I said, I have a couple of announcements this morning. The kids will be next door for, practicing for their Christmas saying. I think that's what they're doing, um, and we just wanted to make sure you guys are aware of that because next week we're going to have it over there in the fellowship hall. We're excited that they're going to lead us in some um, Christmas carols and make sure your, your child picks up a Christmas um, mask as well for that program. Um, youth are having their Christmas party a week from tonight, 5 to 7, over in the fellowship hall. We will be having pancakes and waffles in our pajamas watching a movie. Um, so that's going to be a lot of fun. If you have any questions, parents or teens or anybody, come see me. And let's see. Um, also, the Easter, the Easter, oh my, Lanta, the Christmas Eve service. Um, there will be two different times we're doing that on um, Christmas Eve at 7, at 5, and then at 7. If you um, have not yet RSVP'd you and your family, please do so. You can either text the church um, phone or there's a slip of paper in your pew. Write your family name and how many will be attending and which service you would like to attend and put it in the church uh, building um, back there. And if we, we will, we're going to pray. Um, if you will pray with me, bow your heads as we pray for the service and close your eyes. Um, thank you, Jesus, so much that we get to come to church and worship you, that we um, we have that opportunity, and we are just so grateful for this Advent season and what you have done. And, you know, I said Easter on accident, but we really can't have Christmas without Easter, and we can't have Easter without Christmas. So, so we are just so thankful today for the manger and the cross and the empty tomb. And we just ask that you bless us and um, teach us and um, just stretch us as well. We ask all this in your name. Amen. Uh, please stand as we are um, led in worship by Case and Lorraine. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Sarah. Um, just as we start, I thought it would be cool to share, like this week I was listening to Moody Radio and I was talking about um, just the prophecy of Jesus and how um, exactly where Jesus was born and um, the significance of Bethlehem um, was no accident. And talk about like in Micah um, chapters 5 verses 1 and 2, like it was like 600 plus years before Jesus came that his birth was predicted. And it wasn't like just he's coming. It was like he was of Bethlehem of Judea. And they were talking about how Bethlehem it was known at the time to be kind of some small little town, not significant by any means. Um, and it wasn't just like Bethlehem, period, because apparently there was a couple of different Bethlehems, but it was Bethlehem of Judea, um, which is where um, David and the line of David came from. I thought it was just so cool to just really think about that, like just how planned Jesus' coming was, and there was no accident that he came. Um, and the joy um, that was brought to the world because of the Lord's coming. And that's what we're going to start singing about today. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. So, um, and as I have on my screen here today, Jesus is the reason for the season. So, um, which is why we're here, here today. So, let us sing Joy to the World. Heaven and nature see in heaven. 
heaven and nature sing And heaven, heaven, nature sing Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns Let men their songs employ Fields and flowers, flocks, hills and plain Repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king as Jim was talking about last week he wasn't born a prince but he was born a king the sons of earth born to give them second birth isn't it a joy to be born again in Jesus Christ with God as our Lord and Saviour silent night thank you Lauren
just thank you that we can gather in your house this morning and just sing some of these Christmas carols, Lord, and just remember the special time when a saviour was born among men. We thank you for all that means, Lord, and all that you did with your life, Lord, dying and rising again and paying for our sins, Lord. We did not deserve it, Lord, but you lovingly and willingly went to the cross for us, Lord. And this Christmas time is just a time to Remember that first step of coming to earth as a man and dwelling among us. And we just thank you for who you are and what you're doing in and through us. We just give you praise and thanks in the wonderful and powerful name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Thank you all. You may be seated. Just before the kids are dismissed, we're going to light the, uh, the candles. And then Pastor Jim will share his message with us. three candles today. The first we remember is for our hope that Jesus will come into the world again and make all things right. The second is for peace, helping us remember to make the straight path for Jesus so we can listen to what Jesus wants to say to us. The third candle is is the pink candle, representing joy. We light it to remember to help us remember that joy comes from sharing with others, not just our possessions, but also our time, talents, and gifts. In doing so, we trust that we ultimately bring joy to Jesus throughout our generosity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to give and to share with others joyfully. Even when it's hard, help us to know that your kingdom is one where people share with each other. Help me to see the needs others have and show me the ways I can help meet those needs. Teach us to be generous as people and as we bring joy to the world around us in your name. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Testing. Uh, there we are. All right. <laughs> All right. We just wanted to send the kids off with that this morning. <laughs> well, good morning. I am so excited to share with you. I wish it was under different circumstances, but I am thankful for the opportunity to share nonetheless. Um, if you've been following along with our midweek gatherings, and I'm going to stand here, let me know if I accidentally put the candles out, we'll, we'll relight them. But if you've been following along with our midweek gatherings online, you know that this last several weeks we have been in the book of John, and there we go. We've been in the book of John, and, and we've been talking about different things that Jesus has been doing and different miracles. And uh, the last several weeks we've been doing this series called God is My Help, and it's in John chapter 11. And we've been talking about the story of Lazarus. And so if you haven't had a chance to watch that, I would encourage you to go back and check it out because it's, it's just a great study, and we're going to have our finale this week. But as, I, as I've been reading in John, 
I've been noticing something different. And so as we prepare for this, as we're in the Advent season and we're talking about hope and we're talking about joy and we're preparing for Christmas and what Christmas is, and I was studying through John, I came across uh, a miracle that I before I wouldn't have thought anything about hope and I wouldn't have thought of anything related to the Advent season, but as I was reading it, hope stood out to me, and I want to share that with you this morning. And so it's a little, it's a little different than a typical, I guess, this time of season message, but uh, it, is a, it is a passage that I've shared before on a, a Wednesday night study, but we did the Matthew account. So we're going to be in John chapter 6 this morning, and we're going to be in the first passage, and it's a story that most of us are familiar with, but oftentimes when we read different miracles and we look back, Sometimes we get caught up in the awe and wonder of the, of the physicality, of the physical stuff that Jesus is doing. And, and this miracle deserves that awe and wonder. But there's such a serious spiritual implication here. Much as we've been talking about with Lazarus each week, this miracle as well has a spiritual implication for our lives. But before we get too far, I have a question. And I'm going to share a lot of stories with you this morning. And I have a lot of questions for you. And I'm going to invite you to use your imagination a couple times as well. But the first question I have for you is, have you ever went out to eat, or maybe you eat at home, and you have this meal, but you leave after the meal unsatisfied? You're still hungry. You're not, you're not full, right? I have this example, um, and Erica's not in here now. She's with the kids, so I can, I can make up any date I want. I'll say it was our second year anniversary of dating. I don't know if it was or not, but we went to this fancy restaurant. And I would call it a fancy restaurant, but you guys might not. And we got these meals, and in, the, in, in these meals we got, it was expensive, right? I was a freshman or a sophomore in college, so it doesn't take a lot for it to be a fancy, expensive meal for me. And we ate this meal, and I remember at the end of this meal thinking, man, that was not worth what I paid for. I am still hungry, right? And so we get in the truck, and you know we've been dating for a year or two, and so I'm like, hey, do you want to you wanna go get ice cream now? And she's like, Daniel, are you still hungry? Yeah, I'm still hungry. And she goes, well, I am too. Well, so we're going for round two. So we end up pulling to Puerto Vallarta and we get another dinner, right? Well, we're going to talk about a meal tonight that is going to leave us not hungry, that is going to fill us. And so if you have your Bibles, I said we're going to be in John chapter 6, but I've got one more favor. Before we go much further, I need you all to close your eyes right now. I, can see your, I can't see your nose and mouth, but I can see your eyes, right? <laughs> Let's close our eyes. Now, I want you to imagine your favorite bread item, your favorite freshly baked bread item. Whether you're walking into the restaurant, whether you're opening the oven at home, can you smell this bread? Can you feel the warmth as it's coming out to your table or as it's coming out of the oven? Don't eat it just yet. Just visualize it. Smell it. You all got it? All right, savor that. All right, savor that. You guys can open your eyes now. All right, I'm going to read this passage for us this morning. It's on the screen if you guys want to follow along with me. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed into the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. This is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up, he saw a great crowd coming toward him. And he said to Philip, Philip, where shall we buy this bread for these people to eat? And he asked this only to test him. For he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Jesus, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each to have just one bite. And another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Sorry. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves. He gave thanks, and he distributed it to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they all had had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over, and let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them, and they filled 12 baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountainside by himself. Amen. Amen. This is one of my favorite, 
one of my favorite miracles, and it's, it's one of the only miracles that you can find in all four Gospels. And John's account is just, just a touch different than the account in Matthew. And that's, that used to be my favorite one, but now I'm, I'm a real, real, real big one on this one right now. And so as we, as we see this here, I want you to think about that bread you just visualized, right? Because I'm going to share a couple things about bread with you here. So change, change the context real quick. The year's 2014, and I don't know what your 2014 looked like, but my 2014 wasn't my favorite year ever. Um, I spent the majority of the year overseas, and my job, I worked on an aircraft carrier, which if you're familiar with an aircraft carrier, there's over 5,000 people on that. So much as we just talked about in the passage we read, over 5,000 people, imagine that, over 5,000 people on a boat. And my job required me to work really long hours at this time, and I wasn't able to wait in the lunch line. 5,000 people to get lunch is a lot of people, and I didn't have enough time to wait in lunch, the lunch line. So I had to go through what was called the grab-and-go line. And I call this my 2014 diet because I lived off of rice, pack, to, rice and tuna packets, and it's like 50 pounds lighter than what I am now. It was great. I mean, it was awesome, but I was craving real food. I wanted some real food, some real nourishment, and all this, and I didn't have the time to wait there. Well, long story short, about seven months in, we pulled into Dubai. And has anybody ever been to United Arab Emirates? or Dubai. Well, it's, it's neat. It's this sprawling city in the middle of a desert. And when I went to Dubai, there's a mall there. And this mall is, if you can imagine, about five Selmas stacked together. That's the size of this mall. I mean, this thing's enormous. It's crazy. And when you go down into the basement of this mall, there's the food court. And in the food court, wouldn't you know it, they have a Texas roadhouse. A, a real Texas roadhouse. So, of course, I'm not going to miss this opportunity. I've been eating rice and tuna for the last seven months. So I go down there, and I'm thinking, man, this has the potential to be awesome, or this is going to let me down, right? And so I'm sitting there, and I'm waiting. But I remember as I'm sitting there, I start to smell the rolls. I start to, I start to smell the rolls, and they bring them to the table. They bring the basket to the table, and I'm like, here we go. This is it right here. And I break open the, the roll, and it's warm, and I can feel it. And I dip it in the cinnamon butter, and it tastes just like home. It tastes just like home. And in that moment, something as simple as a Texas Roadhouse roll filled me with the hope to return home. Suddenly, I had this empowerment to continue on with the mission that I was on and to continue on with this hope. Something as simple as a roll, as a piece of bread. Well, maybe you're saying, you know what, Dan, I, I've never been to Dubai, I've never seen an aircraft carrier, can't relate to that story. Well, teens, this one's for you because I know that you guys can relate to this one. So, or maybe if you've had any uh, high school or junior high English, I can't remember what, what year we read it, but there's a series out, a book series or movie series out called The Hunger Games. Anybody familiar? Right? It's kind of a brutal storyline, but I'll give you the quick synopsis. In this storyline, there are 12 districts, just like we talked about in that passage a minute ago with the disciples, 12 disciples, 12 districts. There's 12 districts in this future post-apocalyptic nation of Pan Am. And these districts have to present a, a tribute uh, to battle to the death for food. And this capital will provide that district more food. Often, it was a whole bunch of bread. And if you watch the movie or you re read the books, uh, these different districts would send in bread to the competitors. And so, when doing so, they would often unexpect these gifts. And it provided a sense of hope or a sense of renewal to continue on in their mission. In the same way, if you're familiar with the story, the, the main character, the, the start of the series, she is the hunter and the gatherer for the family. And she comes across, um, which is later her counterpart, uh, he is a son of a baker and he provides uh, burnt bread to the pigs. Well, she grabs it, and when she grabs it, it gives her a new sense of hope, right? So again, you, you get the idea. This unexpected provision of bread providing hope and a sense of renewal. Now think about that, and I want you to think about that bread that you just visualized a minute ago. Because now we find ourselves on the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. The Passover festival is near. It's coming near. Everybody's got this in their mind, right? And Jesus previously has been doing all of these healings, all of these teachings. He's been, he's been er, demonstrating that he is the Son of God by doing all these miracles. So he's working long hours. And this crowd of 5,000, more than 5,000, comes to him and he sees this crowd coming. And I'm sure Jesus was probably pretty tired at this point. But what we know is that Jesus has compassion towards this crowd. Jesus sees this crowd and he says, you know what? What are we going to do? We're going to feed them. That's what we're going to do. And so he looks, at it, he looks at Philip, and this is one of my favorite part. He looks to the disciples, and he asks them to play a role in, about, in what's about to happen. And he looks to Philip, and he says, Philip, 
I'm paraphrasing here. This is Dan's version. Philip, what are, what are we going to do here? Because Jesus already knew, and if you know it from Old Testament stories, providing bread is not out of the realm of God's miracles. He did it multiple times for the Israelites, right? So we know that God's provision is enough. But Jesus looks to the disciples here. Rather than just performing a miracle, rather than just saying, boom, here it is, Jesus looks to Philip and says, I'm, I, I want to see what you're going to say. And Philip gives a logical response like many of us would do. We don't have enough money. We can't feed 5,000 people. They wouldn't even have a bite. What are we going to do? And Well, then Andrew pipes up. And Andrew's like, well, we've got, we've got this boy here who's got, got a lunch, right? And I think about this. I can, I can see this so visually as I read this. Like, if Crosley Bowsman, if you guys had the awesome privilege of hearing me preach for the next seven hours, how great would that be, right? Your stomachs would start to rumble. You'd start to get a little hungry. And Crosley comes up and says, hey, I've, I've got my lunch, right? It's just, it's just two, two fish. And five pieces of bread, but I've got my lunch. And we could do a whole other sermon here about how God takes a little and makes a lot and multiplies the gifts that he gives us. But that's not where we're going this morning. But Andrew says, we've got this boy's lunch. And again, the disciples are like, how far is that going to go among so many? What are we going to do, Jesus? That doesn't, that, that's not really making sense. And in typical Jesus fashion, he just pauses. And he prepares the people to eat. He has them sit down. So they know they're about to eat. So now imagine yourself. You've been listening to Jesus. You've been, you're in this crowd of 5,000. You're in that long lunch line. You're in that long lunch line and you are not expecting a meal. Maybe you, did, maybe you didn't come prepared or maybe you didn't think it was going to go that long, whatever. You're sitting there and you're hungry. And Jesus has you sit down and he begins to break this bread. He begins to distribute these fish and this bread to everyone. Every single person there, the scripture tells us that not one was left hungry. Not one was left unsatisfied, that they ate their fill. And as oftentimes as I read this, I can think, okay, wow. What awe and wonder of the physical miracle that Jesus just multiplied all of that lunch for everybody. But what Jesus was doing was so much more than providing physical nourishment for everyone there. It was so much more than just saying, hey, Here's lunch. Continue to hang out with me. He is providing the first reminder that He is the bread of life. That He is the bread of life that we all need. That in Him we will not go hungry. And so when He looks at the disciples, and He looks at Philip and He says, Hey, what are we going to do? He's inviting His disciples to be a part of this. He's inviting His disciples to step into what He is doing with this bread distribution. Right? So easily Jesus could have just said, Hey, here's the bread. Eat up. But that's not what he did. One, he asked the disciples what to do. And two, he prayed. He gave thanks. And he broke it. So before this miracle is over, he gives his disciples one reminder. It's the first reminder for all their days that this bread is a life-changing bread. He tells them to grab a basket, to pick up the leftovers, to let nothing be wasted. You see, as we read that, we're thinking, oh my goodness... He just provided all of this food for 5,000 plus people and, and there's even leftovers. But there are enough leftovers that every single disciple picks up a basket to be reminded. That Jesus is the provision that we need. That there is provision in God and that is the provision that we need. It's His wish that not one, not one, be wasted. That no one should perish. If we'd hop back three chapters into John 3.16, we know that is why Jesus is here. That no one should perish. That whoever believes in Him. And that is what He's reminding the disciples of here. It's not just that He can do anything and create bread. Absolutely. Praise His name. He can do all of that. But is that it is His wish that everyone comes to know Him because He is the bread of life. That He can satisfy in a way that no one else can. So of course... That meal provided physical nourishment, and what a great, awesome, powerful miracle it was. But it was an unexpected provision. I think about sitting down there, and just all of a sudden, Jesus handing me some bread and fish as he's teaching. I think about my stomach rumbling, and all of a sudden, Jesus handing me a meal and saying, I've got something a little better. Can you taste that bread? You can taste your bread now, right? Can you imagine what those folks on the hillside were experiencing at that moment? They had just watched this awesome miracle that Jesus just did, but He's saying something so much different here. Can you imagine as they're experiencing the Son of God creating a lunch for them, for every one of them, 
that not one of them should go hungry. And then even better yet, put yourself in the disciples' shoes. Put yourself in the disciples' shoes. That you've got this reminder. I, I can just see them picking up this basket on their back. I, I don't know why I picture that. Maybe they carried it like this. But I see them picking up a basket on their back and just throwing leftovers in the basket. Right? Every disciple picked up a basket. Every disciple picked up a leftover as a reminder that not only is Jesus the provision that we need, but that he is calling his disciples. And guess what? If you're a Christian, it's you and I. He is calling us to become distributors of his bread. He's calling us to be bakers. He's calling us to tell everyone we know about the bread of life so that no one should go hungry. Just as I shared about the you know, the Texas Roadhouse roll and then the story of uh, the Hunger Games, that bread that provides a hope. Can you imagine what the folks on the hill were thinking as Jesus is, is teaching them? As they're learning that Jesus is the Son of God, that He is hope for eternity, that life with God is through Him, can you imagine the hope that they're experiencing? As, they are break, as Jesus is breaking this bread and He's handing them this bread and they're smelling it, can you think of that hope? Think of the long day that they had. Maybe better yet, think of the past that they may have had. The year that they may have had. The hurt that they may have had. And Jesus is giving them the bread saying, I've got something for you. I've got something that can satisfy you beyond anything you've ever experienced. Can you guys smell, taste, and feel that hope? that Jesus provides for us today. It's the very same hope that was provided for them on the hillside. It's the very same hope that was provided for the disciples. It's the very same reminder for us today that Jesus is the bread of life. And as we talk about Advent and we prepare for the Christmas season, there's a hope in Jesus Christ. There is a hope in Jesus coming. As He is the bread of life, and, I, and, I, and I, I'm just so visual. I, maybe you guys aren't like that. I don't know. Maybe I'm a visual learner. But I can just see Him repeatedly breaking bread and handing it to every single one. Such a personal touch, because that's what he says. He says he distributed to everyone. Everyone, such a personal touch that anybody sitting in the back, anybody sitting in the front, is going to have their fill. That they're going to experience Jesus at that moment. And if we look closely in our world right now, maybe even in our families right now, at work, at school, we can see this hunger for hope. We can see that people are spiritually starving for truth. That they are hungry. That our friends, that our family, that we know someone who doesn't know Jesus, and they are hungry this morning, right now as we speak. There might be somebody here that's hungry right now as we're talking. So the story setting has changed once again. Now we're in our community. Now we're in this year. And guess what? The bread is still the same. The hope is still the same. That reminder that he gives the disciples is still the same. We've heard the story. We know that God's provision through Jesus is enough. He's inviting his disciples. And if you call yourself a Christian this morning, that's you and I. He is inviting, inviting us to pick up a basket this morning. He's inviting us to pick up that bread and to distribute that bread. You know, you probably came in this morning and never thought of yourself as a baker. Or maybe you do, I don't know. But you're a baker. Jesus is the bread and we are to present that bread from this day forward. We can't leave here this morning and say, well, yeah, that was, that was fun talking about bread. I like bread. I love carbohydrates. And we're talking about something so much more. A spiritual filling that only Jesus can provide. This bread is bread that leaves no one unsatisfied. We have the reminder through the disciples, and we're to present this bread. And there's also something else that's, that's really key as we read this story. Before Jesus broke the bread, what did he do? He gave thanks. He gave thanks for the provision of God. Right, the, Jesus, he, and, and if you've been following along on the, on the Lazarus study we've been doing online in John 11, you know that we've talked twice now about where Jesus paused, where he could have immediately done something, but he paused. And this is just typical Jesus fashion. It's, it's, it's so cool. Man, it's so cool because I'm the kind of guy, I have the kind of mindset where if I see something wrong and I know I can fix it, I want to fix it right now. But Jesus stops. He talks with the Father above and says, you know what? Thank you for this. 
Now they are going to start to know. This is the first reminder, and, and I, I almost we almost did John 21 this morning, but I, I felt like we had to start with this first reminder. This is the first reminder that Jesus is enough. That He is the one that we have to come into relationship with that we can experience eternity because He is the bread of life. So, we started with a question, and I'm going to end with a couple questions. Are you hungry this morning? You probably are after you visualize some of that bread. But are you spiritually hungry this morning? Are you daily dining on the bread of life? Are you visiting that bread each morning? I, I, again, when I open up this Bible, I can just think of a barley loaf of bread right here. Are you hopping in to what Jesus has for you? Because He wants to fill you. Remember, it's His wish that no one should go hungry. Not one should perish. This is a bread that's sweeter than any Texas Roadhouse roll. I like those, but this is even better. This is a bread that changes lives. This is a bread that changed the disciples' lives that day. Oftentimes we just think about those on the hill, but Jesus looked to Philip. And if you look at, if you look at Matthew, uh, the account in Matthew, it's my favorite Bible verse, when the disciples still, they're confused, and they look to Jesus, and they're like, what are we going to do? And, and we've got to send them away. We don't have enough food. Jesus looks right back at him and says, don't send them away. You give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. Jesus is still giving us that call today. We need to give them something to eat. In a world right now that looks a little upside down, with a little hurt, with a lot of hurt, with a lot of uncertainty, the bread still remains. The call to the disciples still remains. That we are to pick up our baskets. That we are to share this with everyone so that not one would go hungry. That should weigh so heavy on our hearts this morning. That should weigh so heavy on our hearts every day that we know people that are hungry. That they haven't experienced this bread of life. And if you know what, if you're saying, Dan, I, I've experienced this bread. I, I, I'm eating this bread. Well, that's great. I want to dine with you today, and I'm going to dine with you in heaven. Awesome. But now let's pick up our basket, and let's go share this bread. Let's go distribute this bread so that not one, say it with me, not one would perish. Not one would go hungry because Jesus is the bread of life. There's a lot of weight to that this morning, friends. And this bread is a bread that, it provides a hope. We're in the middle of the Advent season and we are so excited about celebrating the coming of Jesus and the hope and the joy that that brings because He is the bread. As, as Pastor Sarah said when, when she was getting ready to pray for us that you know Christmas and Easter, they're connected, right? This is the bread we're talking about. This is the bread that goes with us every day. This is the bread that we dine on every day. This is the bread that we share with everyone. And as we're on Facebook and YouTube this morning, you know, there's probably going to be some people that haven't experienced this bread. And I want to give an invitation right now for those people. And if there's someone in here that hasn't experienced this bread, this is your invitation as well. Because like I said, it's sweeter than any Texas Roadhouse roll you're going to have. It's sweeter than anything else that you imagined in your mind. It's a bread that provides a hope. A hope for life eternal with Jesus Christ. So if you could please stand. If you're ready to, to experience that bread, I'm looking at you, Facebook. If you're ready to experience that bread, you can say these words with me. We'll have them on a comment down there below. Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness for my sins. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my old life and invite you to come into my life and to be the Lord of my life. I want to trust and follow you as my Savior. And Jesus... I just pray for those that are hungry. Lord, I pray for those that, that don't know you. I pray that they come to experience the bread that you are. That they come to experience that, that satisfaction, that fullness, and that hope that is only in the bread of life that is you, Jesus. And Jesus, I pray for Christians. I pray for Christians right now that they leave empowered and encouraged and renewed to pick up their basket. That something as simple as a piece of bread 
reminds them of the hope that is in you and then reminds them of the call that you give us to pick up our basket and to be distributors of your bread. To be bakers, Lord. Make us bakers. Jesus, I thank you for the bread. I thank you for who you are. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. You guys may be seated. Case is going to come and, and lead us in a song that talks about this hope that is in Jesus. This living hope that this bread of life represents. Tasting. <laughs> yeah, I love the lyrics of the song as Dan was talking about... Um, what he was talking about today, I thought this would be perfect. It talks about in verse 2, Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken. I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. <coughs> Jesus Christ, my living hope. Amen. Um, so as we, if you all want to stand and sing, um, um, or if you want to sit and just ponder these, um, these l wonderful lyrics of the song about a hope that we have in Jesus who is living. Yeah. 
the promise Your very body began to breathe Out of the silence, the roaring lion You can has no claim on me Jesus, yours is a victory Father, we just thank you that you are our living hope. You are not a God who is dead or doesn't hear us, but you are living and active. We thank you for who you are and all that you've done, Lord. We thank you for your message this morning, Lord, about the bread of life. A bread, um, a spiritual bread that does not leave us hungry, Lord. It leaves us satisfied, Lord, and just wanting more of you and more of your presence, Lord. We just ask that your Holy Spirit go with us this morning, Lord. Be with us and guide us in our way this week as we share the joy of Christmas, Lord, and Jesus, the reason for this season. We ask these things and give you praise and thanks in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Thank you all, Harris Chapel, for being with us. Uh, the offering as well is uh, in the church uh, box, so... Um, feel free to put your offering in there on your way out. Remember to exit out the, the sides and uh, have a wonderful week and uh, congregate outside to fellowship with one another. Thank you all.